If you've been with us for the last couple of weeks in the book of Ephesians, you'll know that where we find ourselves today in verses 11 to 14 is actually at the end of a mammothly long sentence that comes from the mouth of the Apostle Paul. In the original language that he would have spoken and written in, this mammothly long sentence starts all the way back in chapter 1 verse 3 and it goes all the way up to the end of where we're going today in verse 14. So if you've ever seen Ace Ventura, that's the vibe, right? Where he takes in a massive intake of breath and then exhales a huge amount of information in one go. That's the sense, right? There's a, a vastness in this. It kind of, as you listen, gives you a little bit of indigestion, kind of Toby Carvery style. You think, actually, maybe I need to cut this up and digest it in smaller chunks, which is why we've not done verses 3 to 14 in one hour. We've split them up into kind of three different Sundays. Now, even if you can't take everything in, in that one long outtake of breath from Paul, the main thing that he's saying is still easy to spot. He says it four times. If you look at verse 3, he starts off by saying, praise God. If you skim down to verse 6, he says it again, praise God. If you look down to verse 12, he's going to say it again, praise God. And if you look down to verse 14, he's going to say it again, praise God. This long sentence is a loud statement of Paul's praise of God. We lift praise to you because blessings have been lavished down on us. Now that word us is important because if we look at this sentence again, I'm going to read it all, verses 3 to 14. You'll notice Paul is not just praising God personally. It's not just about him It's about us. He's not praising on his own. He's praising with the people of God for what he has done for all of them. Right? So listen to verses 3 to 14 of Ephesians 1. And I'll try and stress this together aspect. All right? So let's go. This mammoth sentence. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through jesus christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he's freely given us in the one he loves in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of god's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things on heaven and on earth under christ now we're going to pause there but you see already how it's not just praising god a me thing it's an us thing it's not just a personal thing it's a praising god together thing you could put it like this Praising God is a unifying thing. It unites people together. Now, that's massively important in a city like Ephesus that had at least two very distinct groups of people who were used to living life divided from one another. In Ephesus, and this is the first one in the shade, in Ephesus it was very much a we and you think. In fact, let's do that visually. Imagine it's we, this half of the room, and you, this half of the room. Now you could call that Jews and Gentiles. We're going to hear it's also described as Jews and Greeks in a minute. But it's clear from what Luke says when he writes about Paul's time in Ephesus in the book of Acts that there are these two distinct groups in the city or in the region. So listen to Luke describing the city of Ephesus. This is Acts chapter 19, verse 10. He says, All the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now what's Luke doing there? He's trying to summarize everyone in the region. He could have just said, Everyone in the region of Asia heard the word of the Lord. But he doesn't. He says, All the Jews and all the Greeks. So in Luke's head... In this region, there is a significant distinction, there's a sharp division, 
later in Ephesians, Paul will call it a dividing wall of hostility between Jews and between Greeks. In Ephesus, there was a we and there was a you. Do you get the point? He does it again, Acts chapter 19, verse 17. Luke says, When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. So again, he's summarizing everyone, but he doesn't just say everyone. He says, now nah, there's a big thing in the city. There's Jews and there's Greeks. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago that there was a riot in the city of Ephesus. Remember that? And actually the riot definitely has a distinctive flavor of Jew-Gentile stuff that's going on that is fueling the riot. It's a significant thing in the city. And so, when Paul is writing, we're going to see, to this church in Ephesus, he wants to help see a city that is divided, united. That's what we're going to see. Now, we're foreigners to a place like Ephesus, but division is not foreign to us, is it? So, you can watch a Ranger Celtic game and you can listen to the sectarian songs that go back and forth. There's a we and there's a you. You could have watched Prince Charles last weekend or last week. Uh, here he is, sat on a gold throne, decked in gold medals, uh, next to a crown that is of gold encrusted with diamonds. It's got its own throne and had his own Rolls Royce to get just from Parliament to Palace. And what's Charles talking about? Leveling up in the cost of living crisis. There is a you and there is a we. You see it in our scheme. Outsiders, immigrants, foreigners can be viewed with suspicion at some level or outright abuse in others. There is a we and there's a you. It can happen in churches. We can gravitate towards those who are most like us because that gives us a life that is most comfortable and least costly. And we'd get to a place in our head where we create caricatures of the other half that makes them out to be way more different from us that we, than we actually are, but allows us to treat them with more suspicion, self-righteousness, and snobbery than they actually deserve. Us and them. We and you. And it can happen in our churches on the basis of colour or culture or class. But again, let's say, this is one of the reasons why Paul is writing this big letter to these churches in Ephesus. He wants to see those who have been divided in Ephesus united in Christ. That's what we're going to see this morning. And that's one of the reasons he's loud on praise. He wants those who have been used to speaking about you and we, we and you, they and us, he wants to speak, see people who are used to speaking like that instead standing together and praising God. That's why it's massively important, I think, for us as a church in this particular moment of our life because we are more diverse than we have ever been. Beautifully so. But when there's more and more than could divide us, we need to be louder and go deeper into what unites us. This is important for us. And so here's what we're going to see this morning. In verses 11 and 12, we're going to hear Paul speak on behalf of the Jews. We. So let's imagine it's you. We. Then in verses 13 and 14, we're going to hear Paul speak to the you, the Gentiles. But actually what we're going to see is by the end of verse 14... Instead of speaking of we and you, he's going to get to a beautiful place where instead he moves to speak about our. It's a beautiful thing. He wants us to get to that place. Now, uh, public safety warning. This is going to feel like a hard sermon, I think. I think it's going to feel like laying a foundation in that it's going to be a lot of work for not a lot of like visible return. So it's about, it's more about believing and being rather than about doing today. But that's okay, we need to lay the foundation and the cash value is going to come later on in the book of Ephesians. But if we're clear on that, I think it will help our expectations for the next 20 minutes. Everyone happy? Okay, 
So in Ephesus, we in you, but we're going to see in Christ our. Now, let's read verses 11 and 12 as he speaks to we. All right, he's speaking with the Jews as a Jew. We. Let's look at verse 11. In him, that's in Jesus, in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything out in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. Now notice that the thing he says first is the thing he has said frequent. In Christ. We've heard that a lot in Ephesians. But he starts here because he wants to say for anyone, but particularly at this moment for the Jews, every blessing we have from God comes through faith in Christ. Now the reason we know that when he says we here, he's speaking about the Jews, is the way he uses the word we in verse 12. If you scan down to verse 12, he says, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ. Now here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the Jewish race were first to win the race to achieve God's blessings, and so somehow they're more worthy than any other race. That's not the point. The point is, it is, as a race, God had chosen the Jewish nation to be the way that he blessed the entire world. And that's why Jesus was born as a Jew. It's why Jesus was born as a Jew in a Jewish part of the world. It's why most of Jesus' first followers were Jewish people. That's why Paul uses the phrase, we who were the first to put our hope in Christ. In verses 11 and 12, he's speaking to Jews who were the first to follow Jesus. And what does it say about them in verse 11? In him, we were also chosen. Now, I don't like to say this very often, and it doesn't happen often, but actually our English translation here doesn't help us very much get to the root of what's going on here. The word chosen has way more in it than just that word. The word chosen here means chosen to be God's possession. Or you could even read it, chosen to be God's inheritance. Now, that means when he uses the word chosen here, he's not just using it in the way he used in verse 4 and repeating everything there. He's actually using the word chosen to repeat a massive theme that God uses to speak of the Jewish nation in the Old Testament. A people chosen to be his own possession. So let me read you a few verses from the Old Testament to get you into this. Listen to, this is Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6. He speaks to the Jewish nation and God says, Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See the way he speaks to them? Treasured possession. Let me read you another place. Deuteronomy 7. He speaks again to the Jews. For you are a holy people, holy to the Lord your God. For the Lord God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord didn't set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest. But it was because he loved you. See the language God uses of the Jewish nation. He says, I choose you, I treasure you, I love you. He says, you're my people. He says, you're my possession. He says, you're my portion, my inheritance. Jews in Christ, you are God's treasured possession. Now, he then answers the question, how? How did that happen? Now look at the way he piles up all the purpose phrases, because here's what we're seeing. In Christ the Jews are God's possession by God's purpose. Look at the words in verse 11 and 12. Predestined, plan, worked out, conformity, purpose, will. Now what's he saying to them? Your privileged place as part of God's possession comes from the purposes of God that spans everything. From eternity past to eternity future. Which means you're not just God's possession. You are sovereignly, safely, 
secured as God's possession. Now he then asks the question, why? So, in Christ, you're God's possession, by God's purpose. Why? End of verse 12, to the praise of God's glory. So here's a Jewish nation going. He loved us when we were unlovely. He treasured us when we were unworthy. He made us his when nobody else wanted us. He blessed us when what we deserved was cursed. And so guess what we do in response? We praise him for everything he's given to us. Now, in Christ, by God's, no, in Christ, God's possession, by God's purpose, to God's glory. The Jews. Now, even if you don't understand everything that we've said there, and even if you don't get everything about what it means, that's okay. Because all I want to do now is go with Paul from the Jews to the Gentiles in verse 13 and 14 and show you Everything he said about them, he is also going to say about you. Okay? So, let's go on from verses 11 and 12 where he speaks to the Jews. And we'll transition in verse 13 to him speaking to the Gentiles. Look at it in verse 13. And you also, see the change? Were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So you, in Christ, God's possession, by his purposes, to the praise of his glory. Here's what we're going to see about you. In Christ, God's possession, by his promises, to the praise of his glory. Let's work through it. Now notice again, it starts... The first thing he says is the thing he said frequently. Included in Christ. Every blessing from God comes to us through faith in Christ. Or actually, to change it to make the point here, every blessing that comes from God to everyone and anyone, Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile, comes through faith in Christ. Anyone who hears the word of truth, anyone who hears the message of salvation, anyone who hears that God sent Jesus for you to redeem you by dying for you, to save you, to adopt you, anyone who hears that and believes that is made part of the people of God. Now, if you've hear, heard that word and you say, man, that is true. And if you hear that word and you say, I need saved, you can be part of the people of God today by believing in Christ, by placing yourself safe in Christ. But look at verse 13 again. Because it says, when you believed, speaking to you, Gentiles, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Now the idea of a seal is ownership. Or you could say possession. In Christ, you also are God's possession. Seal. So a seal is used to show that something belonged to you or came from you. So let's say you're a farmer. You've got some cows. You want to make sure people know they're yours or if anyone nicks a cow, I don't know how you, I mean we had guinea pigs stolen from Gorgie Farm. A cow's slightly harder to steal. But if someone stole your cow, you could go and find it and say, it's got my seal on it, it's mine. Or it might be in a letter that you're sending. You stamp the letter with your seal so that when someone receives it, they know it's from you. Or if the seal's broken, they know that someone else has tampered with it. A seal says, mine. So what God says of you also is exactly what he said of you. Mine. My treasured possession. My seal on them says they're mine. Isn't that a beautiful thing? God is not embarrassed to put his seal on you so that people know that you belong to him. Oh. If I had a cow that could win the Highland Cow Competition for being an absolute beaut of a beal, I would put my seal on it. If I had a mangy little cow... Who am I? 
a mangy little cow. What does God do? Mine. In Christ, God's possession. But again, he asks a question. How? Answer, by God's promise. Look again at verse 13. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now here we spoke of by God's purpose. Here the language is a promise. But actually God's promises find their foundation and their fulfillment in God's purposes. The purposes he had for the Jews included a promise that through his blessing to them, the blessing would flow to the entire world. He promised that one day his spirit would be poured out on all flesh, on all different kinds of people. And so the the language here is reminding us that it's not just you that are by the purposes of God, but you who are included by the purposed promises of God in Christ, God's possession, by his purposes. And again, why? Look at the end of verse 14. (coughs) To the praise of God. So that you and you, we and you, can sing the same song because we have received the same thing from the hand of God. In Christ, God's possession, by his promises, to the praise of his glory. You see the point? Which is why, look at verse 14. He speaks of the Spirit, the one who's promised, who is a deposit guaranteeing not we and you, but our inheritance. Dividing wall, gone. Two halves of the room, gone. We and you, gone. Our inheritance. He is father to you and he's father to you. He's our father. He's adopted you to sonship. He's adopted you to sonship. Our inheritance. In Christ, no longer we and you, but our. What God has done makes the two groups one. Now, let's just take a breath, right? Because this is foundation graft. It's hard work. But you see what's going on here? Jews and Gentiles, no longer two, but one. Unity. Now, if you remember what Tim was saying last week from the end of verse 10, unity should be ringing in your head. So look back to the end of verse 10. What is the ultimate of all things in this world? What is the goal to which God is bringing everything? It says, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, you do not have to look very far to see that this is a world defined by disunity. Russia and Ukraine. Israeli forces attacking a journalist's funeral. Another mass shooting in America. Uh, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Wagatha Christie. All of these things. A world of disunity. People not at peace in their homes. People not at peace with their spouses. People not at peace in their own bodies. People not at peace with their own minds. But here's why at the start of his letter, Paul is laying this foundation. Because he says, in a world defined by disunity, and before we reach the final unity that Christ is going to bring to all things, the church can be different in the here and now. In a world of disunity, the church is to be a place where we get a foretaste of the unity that Christ is going to bring at the end of time. Churches are meant to be an oasis, a haven, a refuge from the disunity of the world. They're meant to be a place where God's grace brings God's peace. Remember how the letter started? Grace and peace. Because in Christ there's power for people to forgive one another. In Christ there's power to restore relationships. In Christ there's power to get past our differences. In Christ there's power to get past past hurt. That's a massive reason why Paul is writing this little letter. To reinforce and restore unity 
in churches. And as we read this letter, he's going to get proper practical. He will speak to two different groups of people who have an issue because they are looking down on each other with this snobbery and reverse snobbery thing going on. Can you imagine anything like that? Or he's going to speak to marriages that are unbelievably shaky. Hard to imagine. He's going to speak to Christian employees who work together, who don't get on together. Can you imagine that? He's going to speak to dads who exasperate their kids. Very hard to imagine. But in all these things, when he speaks to these different groups, when he speaks to the marriages, when he speaks to the employees working together, when he speaks to the parents and their children, he is going to build on this foundation. He's going to get the Christians in a room and he's going to go, what is our identity together in Christ? And how does how God has treated us empower us to treat one another? You see the foundation he's laying? The church can, the church ought to be different. But last thing, when we're weary in this world, defined by disunity, still waiting for the world to come, and maybe especially when the church isn't the oasis that it ought to be, the amazing news at the end of these verses is that God doesn't leave us on our own. It says he gives his spirit as a deposit. Did you notice that language in verse 14? Read it again. The promised spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. What does that mean? It means if we are in Christ, God has put his spirit in us to guarantee to us that he has something better for us. The spirit of God in a Christian guarantees that sin will not have the last word. The Spirit of God in the Christian guarantees that death will not have the last word. The Spirit of God in the Christian guarantees that the disunity of this world will not have the last word. The Spirit of God in the Christian guarantees that your guilt, your abuse, your shame, Your anxiety, your cancer, your dementia, your addiction, your old age will not have the last word. The Spirit is the guarantee that one day the sorrow, the sadness, the suffering, the sickness, the struggling, the squabbling, the sobbing, the sinning will end. And you will be redeemed, set free. All of it. So let me ask you. Do you know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Now again, we can look at the rest of Ephesians and find out what does that mean? How do I know? Let me give you a few things. Is the presence of the Spirit with me? Is there an instinct in you to praise God for all the blessings he's given you? Chapter 1, verse 3. Are you getting to know God better? Chapter 1, verse uh, 17. Do you know his power in you to say no to sin? Chapter 1, verse 19. Has there been a change in you from the spirit that you used to follow? Chapter 2, verse 2. Is there an enjoyment in your life in the access that you have to God in prayer? Chapter 2, verse 18. Is there a desire in you to reconcile with people that you're at odds with? Chapter 2, verse 22. Is there a passion in you to read the scriptures that the Spirit inspired? Chapter 3, verse 5. Is there a growing inner strength in you? Chapter 3, verse 16. Is there a growing appreciation of the love of Christ? Chapter 3, verse 18. Is there a concern in you that you don't grieve the Spirit in the way that you live? Chapter 4, verse 30. Is there an awareness every single day that you need to be filled with the Spirit? Chapter 5, verse 18. Do you find yourself 
arming yourself and praying the Bible when you're in the spiritual battle. Chapter 6, verse 17 to 18. Because if you know something of these things, it is the guarantee of God to you that he's got a lavish inheritance waiting for you. The reality that he's recreating you is the guarantee that one day he will recreate all things. It's a deposit. A guarantee. So Paul ends this long sentence in essence saying to us together don't give up. (coughs) Double down on the spirit. Double down into this deposit. Be louder about what unites us. Go deeper into the one who unites us and know that his purposes and his promises will keep you until this promised end.